engineering technology group also at aerospace. And what we are is cultural memory for how to build spacecraft. And we have to, our lives revolve around remembering how things work and trying to drive errors, the discovery of errors earlier in the process. Our area doesn't actually uh, develop spacecraft, but we evaluate the software of the spacecraft that other people develop, as well as the ground systems. So what we find is that uh, software architecture and flaws in software architecture, if you can discover them early enough, you can cut down the cost and the scheduled impact to the program dramatically. The faster you find these things in development. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll give you a for instance, if you were if you're in the avionics world, if you find something in the lab that costs you 10 bucks to fix, if the pilot finds it out on the, out on the runway, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and lives are at stake. So you can't really afford that. Um, we had a project that, Air I'll just, that Aerospace put together to try and discover architecture strengths and weaknesses early in the process. Uh, find methodologies that are used across the acquisition phases, provide guidance, put together a tool. You know, the most important thing we had to do is, uh, you know what Bring Me a Rock is? You know, not everybody, I want a rock and you bring a rock and someone goes, no, not that rock. So if we find a flaw in an architecture, it's not actually fair to develop, to tell somebody, here's a flaw in your architecture. You have to come up with some solutions for it. Uh, that's the most important thing we do is come up with actionable recommendations. So uh, I am not actually a software architecture guy, but we put together a team at Aerospace, including people who've written the textbooks on software architecture. Uh, Eric Dashiki is one of those. Um, to try and discover what you have to look at in an architecture early enough to make sure that all the bases are covered. So. Um, we also wanted to standardize the way the assessments are done. And aerospace is actually embraced this. It's the way we will do business going forward from now on. Uh, and we're happy to teach this to others as well. One of the problems that we found, uh, aerospace is very, uh, very much involved, as I said, in evaluating, in evaluating uh, the software and the architectures for a lot of programs. What we, what we find is a problem when, you call, when a program office calls for help, it kind of depends on who they get to help them to make sure they have a complete review of the set of documentation. And we wanted to avoid the situation where people show up with a hammer and say, show me where the nail is. You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense to you? We want to make sure that, every, that we get a complete review of an architecture. So we had to get a, a good way to partition the work. Uh, we had to make sure we were objective, and we had to make sure we collected enough expertise from across the entire uh, the entire uh, body at aerospace to make sure we put their knowledge into what we were looking at. So what did we do? We discovered that there were, this is actually an ever-growing set. Every time we exercise this thing, it, it changes. Um, we discovered that there are approximately 34 different dimensions that we choose to look at. I'm going to show you what they are in a moment. 34 different dimensions that we look at. When these slides were written, we had about 1,000 questions that we looked at for software architecture. This is, is this unwieldy enough for you? Um, it's actually grown to about 1,400 questions. Uh, there are four major categories of questions. And three of those categories are more academic. And one of them is really what most people think about is the performance of a, of a particular system. Um, that's way too many things to look at in an architecture. So we develop guidelines for a team getting together with program stakeholders, now that's customers, and developers, contractors, and determine what's most important to be evaluated at any given moment in an architecture. The reason is that this kind of a framework can be executed several times during program development. The customer who's actually purchasing a system can
can execute this kind of a framework to help them go through an analysis of alternatives to design a reference architecture for the system they want. And then once they've purchased a system from a, a, from a contractor, you can go through an evaluation with the contractors to help them expand their notion of what the architecture should be to make sure they get through a PDR successfully and then execute it again at CDR to make sure they get through it successfully without major flaws heading towards the actual implementation. Um, and we've actually put together a tool that manages to hold all the data in one place to facilitate that. Now let me, let me dispel some notions. Some people at Aerospace looked at this and they said, this is very nice. Does it do automatic analysis of the architecture? And the answer is no. This relies on experts like you guys and others to actually execute and make sure that nothing is forgotten. That's what this is for. Okay. So these are the categories that we look at. Uh, architecture description is how people put together the architecture. You can see the, the category, the, the subcategories there. One of the things that in, in my mind is most important to keep track of not always kept track of well, we point to it, is architecture trade-off documentation. Well, we've, it's easy to see or imagine that this would happen. Uh, a system is in development, a bunch of people do trade-offs, they decide to head down a certain path, <coughs> other options are discarded, they don't write it down, years later the program is running out of money and they have to change the way they do business. Staff has changed, because these programs often take years to develop, they go back, they choose something that was previously discarded. Nobody really remembers why they didn't do it that way in the first place. There was a good reason. You didn't write it down. It's good to make sure you write them down and save them for the future. Uh, the scope, the priorities, and the trade-offs. How much of the architecture has to be covered, the software quality attributes and trade-offs. These are more academic or programmatic. If you go over to the far end here, architectural development evolution. What's the process they're using for putting it together? Do the people know what they're doing? Do the people communicate? Are they using different tools? Is system engineering using a different tool than software engineering? There's a nightmare waiting to happen if you do that. But that's really not the architecture you're interested in. The actual performance to deliver the functionality of the particular system, here are some of the items. Uh, again, the trade-offs, the performance trade-offs and decisions flow down of the architecture, the system architecture, the software architecture. Does it flow? Is it actually traceable? Is there an allocation to software requirements and software architecture consistency with user interface? I can't tell you how important this is. Um, you know, let me tell you a quick story, just a quick sideline. Do you, you guys are ever in, am I doing it wrong? <laughs> so, not irking. Okay. I, I'm not going to touch anything. I didn't touch anything. My hands are out of my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Want to hear your life. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, as far as user interface, I don't know if you guys would get involved in uh, rehearsals, and drills, right, with the satellites. Yeah. Okay. So here's one of the nightmares. They they beat the hell out of the users, and this is all at the end of the program, right? They beat the hell out of the users. Come on, do this, run through this anomaly, go through this test like you fly situation, and the users have a hell of a hard time. And you know what? They get marked down. You know, if they're having a hard time, it could be that it wasn't designed right at the beginning, that it wasn't well thought out. I'm just saying. Uh, you chose COTS or GOTS or whatever. Did you choose the right one? Could you have chosen better? Why did you choose that? You, oh, reuse. There's a fellow at JPL who uh, gives a talk periodically on reuse. He says, if you've got to write more than about 5% of the code, if you've got to touch more, just throw it away to start. You know, waste all your time. Pass it. Uh, modularity, scalability, flexibility, reliability, timeliness and performance, manageability. Uh, so you can kind of see how these things how these things go. Each one of these things has dozens and dozens of questions, parent and child relationships. Uh, let's go on to the next one. It's overwhelming, right? It's just incredibly overwhelming. You know, wait, before we do it, let me tell you how we first executed all of these things. We had a, we've done this thing about eight or ten times already. 
somebody came to us for the program. They said, I want to know what kind of risks I have in my architecture. We said, OK, what's most important to you? And they said, well, we want you to look at these kinds of characteristics in the system. And they gave us a list. <coughs> then we took all of the requirements. They had hundreds. And we took all of our dimensions. We had dozens. And the team went and matched dimensions to requirements, the system level requirements. And then, for each dimension, what we did was we allocated dimensions out to engineers, and no dimension was left uncovered. And we chose engineers to look at the dimensions with their inherent sets of questions, uh, who were experts in those particular areas. So if you were doing a ground system and you had to know about service-oriented architecture, I know this is the wrong order to answer that, but you can imagine there's such a thing. We picked people who've actually built SOA systems over and over again. So and they know what to look for. Uh, for people who would understand the intricacies of modularity and layered architecture, we pick people who would know how to do that. If there were, there were telemetry involved, we pick people who had to deal with telemetry systems so they knew what to look for. Then you assemble your list of questions. We have a generic list of 1,400 questions, but that doesn't do you any good. You actually have to tailor those. And when I say tailor, you actually excise, you remove some questions, and then you make a bunch of them actually specific to the program. Make sure that if it says expandability, it means that the constellation is going to expand from three satellites to seven, and can your ground system handle it when it's delivered? Make it as specific as you possibly can. And then you're going to go and hunt for evidence. Okay? And the hunting for evidence part is either documentation or review with the program office, or it's interview with the contractor. OK, very good. So let's move on. So this is a, just an example of what some of the questions look like. Uh, the category is architectural satisfaction of functional qualities. The dimension is modularity and layered architecture. And here's a bunch of questions. Is there a clear and reasonable separation of concerns, uh, like uh, application from inter infrastructure, user interface, hardware operating system, whatever? Are modular design principles used, high cohesion among components, weak coupling, et cetera? Now look. This requires subjective knowledge. Make no mistake, you've got to have an expert look at this stuff. This is not for, it's, it's not for kids. You need an expert to do this. But it helps make sure that you didn't forget anything. Um, the framework is not an evaluation process. Make no mistake. I had one program executive. It was really embarrassing. I mean, it's a very high level person. She looks, she goes, OK, so how did my architecture score? Am I an 8 or a 9? I said, no, ma'am, it doesn't work like that. Here's the list of strengths, and here's the list of weaknesses, and you probably want to address the list of weaknesses. Um, it does work in, for space systems, ground systems, launch systems. It can be done for uh, all of them, because we've built in the space knowledge, the space set of questions, into the framework. It is completely agnostic with respect to the methodology used to elicit the architecture. Some people use SEI's uh, ATAM. Other people have other tool suites they use. There are a whole bunch of them. It doesn't matter. This is a, me this is a knowledge assembly methodology. OK. So I got to tell you, it was a load of fun doing this in Excel. Uh, not really. It took, uh, it took us a, quite a long time to actually break out that, that first system in Excel with all their requirements. So we got one guy together. Actually, it was the, uh, the fellow who wrote the software architecture textbook. <coughs> and he said, hey, I can put a tool together for this. And he did. It's a really cool database tool. It's shareable, of course, amongst all the evaluators. Evaluators get to tailor their questions. They have their assignments in place. Uh, it keeps track of how well they're actually, for those of you that are program management, it keeps track of how well the evaluators are doing and actually completing their assignments. That's kind of fun. <coughs> and it lets them rate the quality of the evidence that they're seeing with regard to any particular question area, which is very useful. Uh, this is the kind of stuff it looks like. Um, you can take a look here. You can, you are places for the question. There's answers. You can have a place to put evidence. Eric Dashif, he's the author. Is the evidence clearly written and expressed? We actually have places to also put in hyperlinks to keep track of the evidence. And it's repeatable. You Pardon? Does it look familiar? No. no. OK. Um, 
And you can run this over and over and over again on a program. Now, I got to tell you, we've, uh, we've done this several times. We had one fellow, oh, it generates reports. Comes up with, it'll write out the questions for you. It'll show the answers. It'll show ratings. Uh, it'll pump out target questions and answers in Word or Excel or however you're, you're in PDF. It doesn't matter. Uh, Whatever is convenient for you. Um, let me tell you, we had one guy come to us and say, I have a completely cot solution. I don't need no stinking architecture review. I'm not interested. I'm here because my manager told me to come here. And so we said, sit down with us for an hour. And he did. And we said, let's go through. Can you answer these questions? You're going to get ready for a PDR. <coughs> and we went into the cot set of questions. right? And he looked, and his eyes got real wide, and he said, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I can't answer any of these. Said, real good. Here's your list of questions. Go take these. And he went, and he had something valuable within an hour to go take and do something with so he can go and get, get information. Anyway, that's what it is. We're available to, to teach or show or help anybody with this. If you're interested, my email is down there, and we'd be happy to talk to you.